One of the things I really like about the book of Psalms is that they are entirely and utterly realistic. And by that, I mean they reflect the fact that life is far from a continuous high, even if you are a believer in Christ. You are not walking around the whole time, I'm sure, singing Hosanna, hallelujah. There are depths, even in the life of the disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. And many of the Psalms, and I would say it's a, it's a good 40% perhaps of the Psalms reflect the fact that this worshipper of God who wrote the Psalms has basically been going through a really tough time, something that here he describes as depths. And I'm sure many of us feel like that. Sometimes I come to church on a Sunday morning and it is a tendency in modern Christian worship that all of the songs are upbeat, yes? The Psalms, including this one, by a long way, are not all upbeat. The, the Psalms reflect life how it actually is for many of us during the week. Sometimes you have a really... Now, I was trying to find an adjective to describe how your week may have been. I couldn't find one that I could repeat. In a, so I'm just going to use the word bad. I've had a really bad week. But use your imagination. They, I'm sure you can you know, find a suitable adjective. And then you come into church on a Sunday morning and you want to relate to God. You want to reflect how your week has been uh, to God. But, you know, you go through the hymn book and there's not many hymns that actually begin, Lord, I feel really depressed. <laughs> but that is the fact of life. We do. Sometimes we even come here this morning and we feel in a deep place. Or in modern English, we might say in a dark place. And the Psalms actually are true to life. Many of the Psalms uh, reflect the life of the, the worshipper as being somewhere down there. We use the word depressed, don't we? Depressed means low down. And very often, that, that is how we feel. It could be for many different reasons. Some people I know, especially single people, uh, the isolation during the pandemic has been a really deep place. Other people have received maybe bad news, you know, death of a relative, uh, uh, severe illness, and that's their deep place. It could be financial problems, relationship problems, work problems, many different kinds of problems, and that, for many of us, is a deep place. This is the starting point of this psalm. The psalmist calls out to God from the deep. Who does he call to? Well, out of the depths, I cry to you, Lord. When we are in a deep place, what is the first place that we turn to? What, what is the first thing we tend to do? For many of us, it may be we turn to God immediately. But for some of us, perhaps, we don't. We call a friend. We speak to a family member, the, the pastor, maybe. Or we go on social media to try and find out the answer to our problem. If it's an economic, financial problem, we might turn to advice uh, on the internet. All of these things are okay. You know, to talk to a friend, family, pastor, and so on is okay. But ultimately, when we are in a deep place, when we're in a dark place, we should turn to the Lord. Because he is the one, for sure, who will have an answer. And it's not just turning to the Lord. He doesn't say, I spoke to the Lord. He actually uses this word, cry, to cry out. It's not cry weeping, but it is a cry that comes from one's inner being. You appeal to the Lord with a crying voice. It's not just saying your prayers. You know, that this is a cry that comes out of the heart to the Lord. And he asks the Lord to be attentive to his cry. Not just to hear it, yeah, to hear it, yes, but to be attentive, which means actually to take heed to it. That's what this word means, to take heed to it, to act upon it. When we come to God, 
we don't just want an audience, we want an answer. God will hear us. But you're not just looking for God to merely hear the words you're saying. You're looking for him to be attentive to those words, to answer those words. At the church uh, that I'm at a long uh, time ago now, there was this elderly brother. He's since passed away and gone to be with the Lord. But one of his favorite expressions on the subject of prayer was pray through. Simply that. When you're praying about something, pray through. And I never asked him what he actually meant by that, although although you you can sense the feeling of what it was. But a friend of his was explaining to me, who who knew this uh, deceased brother very well, he says, you know, pray through, pray to get an answer. Don't just speak your prayer and then leave it, but just continue in an attitude of prayer. Pray through. Don't just pray, but pray through. Pray for a response. Continue in prayer until God answers you. Okay, so that's the first couple of verses. There's a lot in there. Uh, And, you know, I would strongly recommend that uh, sometime later, today or during the the week, you go back and and go through this psalm again and and reflect upon the wealth of its uh, spiritual teaching. So, the psalmist is in the depths, as many of us will feel from time to time, maybe even now. And in the depths, we're encouraged to turn to the Lord of all people, to cry out to him from the heart that he would be attentive and respond to our prayer. In the second stanza, the psalmist brings up the subject of sin. This is a word we we don't particularly enjoy hearing, but I would say that for the psalmist, we don't know who the psalmist was. It could have been David. David seemed to have uh, written uh, many of the psalms. It could have been him. But I think that for this uh, person, whether it's David or not, his depth, his deep place, was the sin that he had committed. And I think that's very appropriate. Because I think, reflecting on what the Bible teaches about us and our nature and the nature of God, I think that sin is probably the deepest low that we could sink to. Out of all the tragedies that could happen to us in life, whether it's you know, health, bereavement, poverty, Uh, mental issues, emotional issues, relationship issues, these are all tragedies. But I think the greatest tragedy of all is the sin that separates us from God. I think that is far more serious than all the... I'm not saying these other things are not tragedies, they are, but the greatest tragedy of all, as Isaiah tells us, is sin. He says... To God, Isaiah, your iniquities have separated you from your God. Your sins have hidden his face from you. That's the effect that sin has. And I was listening to a sermon earlier in the week. I can't remember who. I think it was Rick Warren from Sandalback Church. And he said that the greatest tragedy in life is not death. It's actually committing sin that separates you from the God who is life. And and I I totally agree with him uh, on that. So the psalmist here is thinking of sin, his own sin. Perhaps that is his deep place. And he says to God, if you, Lord, kept a record of sins, Lord, who could stand? He's asking the question. If God were to keep a record of our sins, who could stand? And he's asking the question, and the answer is obviously what? No, nobody, nobody could stand before God if God were to keep uh, a record of sins. And I've only put a half of the stanza there because there is another verse coming here. Uh, and th- this verse is just so wonderful. It begins with that word, but. And it says, but there is forgiveness. 
With you, there is forgiveness. This is the wonderful but. This is one of the wonderful contrasts in Scripture. You know, in the New Testament, there are some really well-known ones. Romans 6, the wages of sin is death, and you think, oh, that's great. Next word is but. The free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You were once dead in trespasses and sins, Ephesians 2. But God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive together with Christ. O Lord, if you should keep a record of sins, who could stand? Nobody. But with you there is forgiveness that you may be. It says revered. The the word there literally in, in Hebrew, the language it's written in, is that you may be feared. And we today don't really like to talk about, you know, fearing God. And in one sense, that's right, because it doesn't mean to be afraid of him, but it does mean to fear him in, in in the sense of, as it says here, to revere, to have a deep respect. Because whether or not our sins are counted against us is entirely down to God and our relationship with him. In other words, our eternal fate, our eternal destiny, is entirely in his hands. And that means when we come to him, when we think of him, when we speak to him, it should always be with this deep reverence. There is forgiveness. It's not saying it's automatic. It says there is forgiveness with you. And as a consequence of that, God should be feared in the sense of reverenced. Okay, so we come on to this uh, third stanza now, and here there is a word that is repeated several times over, and it's not a word actually this day and age that we like to hear very much, and that word is wait. Yes, good. You're on form this morning, apart from the Halloween bit at the beginning. Yeah, you're you're on (laughs) You know, I thought at least one person might have known. Today, yeah, Reformation Sunday. No, okay, I'll I'll forgive you that one. But you got this, he says, wait, five times. And this is not something we like doing, is it? You know, modern culture, we like everything to be instant, whether it's, you know, food or or whatever. Uh, We like, you know, things to be done snappy. We don't like waiting in the doctor's surgery or the dentist. We don't like waiting at the station for a train or waiting for a bus. Uh, You know, life is is at such a fast pace. We, We think that waiting, you know, is totally dead time. But here, the psalmist says, I wait. And he says... He, he waits more than the watchman for the morning. And we'll come to that in a second. But what's he waiting for? What is the psalmist waiting for? Now, I found, found what the psalmist had to say here quite, quite significant because he doesn't actually say he's waiting for the Lord to answer his prayer. It's more than that. He actually says, I'm waiting for the Lord. And if you say to someone, well, you know, what are you waiting for? You say, oh, I'm waiting for my friend. What what does it actually mean? Well, you're waiting for the friend to show up. And I think this is what the psalmist is saying. He's praying to be be delivered from this deep place, but there is something even more important than that, which is to wait for the Lord himself. And one thing that struck me about this is that when we come to God in prayer, okay, we're praying for an answer, but prayer is a relational thing. And how much are we praying to actually meet with God in our prayer? Because to me, that is the essence of prayer. Prayer is all about relationship. It's not all about asking and receiving, asking and receiving. Prayer is an act of communion, communion with God. And, and to me, that, you know, I, I read a lot of these spiritual classics over the years. I mean, even people like Martin Luther, but also uh, John Bunyan uh, and uh, many others. 
Uh, and f for these you know, great spiritual teachers, uh, it seems that they, they would actually pray in order to commune with God rather than simply to pray and hold out their hands and hope to receive from God. And if actually God shows up, that is the greater blessing. Rather than to be delivered from that deep place, it is a greater blessing to experience the presence of God in that deep place. I'd rather be in the deep place with God than not be in the deep place without God. This is a wonderful experience to encounter God in prayer. It comes to that point in your prayer where you, you don't think, I'm just speaking to the air or I'm just talking to an empty room. There can come that point in prayer when you just become so aware of the presence of God with you. It's almost tangible. I have to confess, it does not happen to me every time I pray. But it has been something I have experienced from time to time over the years. Why is it that sometimes it happens, that God shows up, and that sometimes it doesn't? It all depends on how long I wait. It's the time you put in. Yeah, good, you're doing very well today. In my own church, I'm very reluctant to throw out questions to the congregation because you can be sure that they would just mess it up totally nine times out of ten. Now, that's not true, but uh, I'm, I'm very hesitant about it. But you're doing, you're doing very well. Wait. The time that we put in seeking the, the presence of God will be rewarded by being given a sense of that presence. If it's just a brief, perfunctory prayer in the morning or in the evening, it's very, very unlikely that God is going to actually show up in person in the way that we have been describing. Wait upon the Lord, uh, the psalmist says. Waiting has two different senses, doesn't it, in English? Yeah, wait just means, you know, uh, kick your heels, do nothing for time to pass, like when you're in a waiting room or whatever, there's that kind of waiting. Well, yes, this word does mean that. But there's the other kind of waiting, isn't there? Because it also means the other kind of waiting, to, like the waiter waiting at a table. It means to attend, to, 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 to be you know, there, uh, attending to the needs of that person. And... When we talk about waiting in the context of the psalm, it's not purely passive, okay? God, please come to me. I want to commune with you. I want to meet with you this morning. Okay, God, please, you know, and you keep... It's not simply that kind of waiting. This is an activity. It is an activity of the soul. When he says he's waiting, it's really his soul that is waiting. Waiting upon the Lord is an activity of the soul where we lift our soul up to God to look for him, to seek his presence, to try to find him. And the psalmist here likens this to a watchman waiting for the morning. In ancient Israel, especially at night, uh, it was common to post watchmen on the walls of the city and if there was some kind of attack or invasion, they would sound the alarm. But if ever you've been in, in this position, I used to have a, job, a night shift once, and really, you know, uh, this was a long, long time ago, uh, really the thing you long for most if you're on a night shift is the morning. Um, and I'm sure if you were a watchman standing on the walls of a city in Israel, I'm sure you wouldn't be thinking, oh, I just wish an enemy would come. You know, I think the thing you're probably thinking most of all is when is it going to be morning? You know, and you look at your watch, well, they wouldn't have had watches, but, you know, a watchman waits more than anything else for the morning. And uh, they didn't have bold letters when uh, the psalm was written or underlying, so he repeats it twice. This is how we should wait for the Lord, more than watchman for the morning, more than watchman for the morning. It's an activity, 
an activity involving the soul, looking out for God. And if we are prepared to do that, if we are prepared to do this waiting in the passive and active sense, from time to time, God will come and we will feel his presence and we will be blessed. So we need to learn how to wait patiently upon God and often the longer we wait, the greater the blessing. It's not just a passive thing, it's active. It's an activity of the soul. And Isaiah says this well-known passage, those who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. That is what it's like when we wait and God comes. We renew our spiritual strength and we mount up with wings like eagles. That's what the experience is like of encountering God in prayer when we wait for him and he actually shows up. And so we come to the final stanza, uh, verses 7 and 8. And the psalmist here, having experienced these things for himself, he now appeals to his own people, to Israel, the people of God. We are the Israel of God today. And he says, put your hope in the Lord. No matter what our dark place is, with the Lord there is always hope. There is no situation that is beyond his help. There is always cause for hope in the Lord, even if it's sin. Some commentators say, well, this is David, and his deep place was the adultery that he had committed with Bathsheba, or, or whatever it is. There is no place that's too deep that God cannot get us out of it. There is always cause for hope. So he's still thinking of sin here, I'm sure, and that is because he uses this word redemption. And redemption is quite a key word in the Bible. And he says here, with him, with the Lord, there is full redemption. So what does redemption actually mean here? There's two basic ideas in redemption. And whenever we see this word in the Bible, or the, the verb redeem, there's two ideas we need to bear in mind. Redemption, first of all, means that something, or perhaps someone, is being held, is being possessed, is being kept in some way, often forcibly, like being enslaved. That's the first idea behind redeem. That, that is the basic situation that redemption addresses. And then the second key idea is that in order for that thing that is being held or possessed or enslaved to be released, a price has to be paid. And in the Bible, the most common way that redemption would be understood is talking about slavery. There is a slave owner who owes, owns slaves, and yet someone can come along and pay for a slave to be released. And they would use the word redeem and redemption for that. We are being held captive and a price needs to be paid for us to be set free. And this redemption, God is able to perform fully, he says. With him, there is not just redemption, there is full redemption. I can't remember what the NIV says here. It might, might be plenteous redemption, is it? Or is it abundant redemption? It's full. It's full. Okay. <laughs> you get the idea. It, it, it's not that the psalmist is emphasizing it. This redemption that we need, that we look for, is a full redemption. It's an abundant redemption. It's a plenteous redemption. What our redemption requires is for us to be set free from what it is that enslaves us. Here is my next question to everybody. What is it that enslaves us? Sin, yes, well done. Okay, yeah, you're doing very well. I'm impressed. 
Paul says several times in the New Testament, we are slaves to sin. Something we experience constantly is the effect, the power that sin can have over us. And a price needs to be paid to set us free. The price was God himself coming down in the form of Jesus. He took on our nature and he paid the price so that we would have this redemption. In him, in Jesus, we have redemption through his blood, through his death, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace. That last verse of the psalm says that he himself will redeem Israel. And that's exactly what he did. Emphasis on himself. He himself paid the price so that we could be redeemed. And then the very last line there, you know, I think we should pay attention to the small words as well. And there's a small word in that last line, but it's one that I find tremendously encouraging. And what do you think that word is? All. all. Yes. Good. It's the word all. Not just some of your sins. There is no sin that we can commit that God is not able to forgive. It's a full redemption. It's an abundant redemption. And he will redeem Israel. He will redeem his people. He will redeem you. He will redeem me from all our sins. And I think in the New Testament, the, the Apostle John may have been thinking of this last verse of the psalm when he says in his first letter, if we confess our sins, as we need to do, God is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God will redeem Israel from all their sins. He will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So there is Psalm 130. And so as we end now, what I would like you to do is just look through the psalm there that we've considered together. Can you see now why this, this can be described as a gem? Do you get some sort of sense why this was Martin Luther's favorite, favorite psalm? So just casting our eyes over the words of the psalm, what has God been saying to you through his spirit this morning? And I just want you to identify, look there for one thing, perhaps more than anything else that God has been saying to you. And then in the silence, in the quiet, I just want us to spend a few seconds just sort of meditating, processing that, and praying it into our minds and into our hearts. So just have a look, and then we'll just spend a few seconds in silence praying to the Lord.